we are not contending against flesh and blood not against flesh and blood but against the principalities against the powers against the world rulers of this present darkness against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places there are three surprises you get when you read the Bible in relation to our subject of angels number one that there are such beings, that there are angels, other intelligent creatures in the universe, supernatural, beyond our senses, superhuman, but they are there. The second surprise is to discover that there are bad ones as well as good ones. And the third surprise is that these bad angels are not in some underworld, they are in heavenly places. That's where all the angels are anyway. And the bad ones are there as well as the good ones who lie behind most of the troubles that we're having in this old world of ours. Now this is the real answer to the old, old question, where did evil come from? The Bible makes it quite clear that it didn't originate with God. When God made everything with his hands, he looked at it and he said, that's good. That's very good. Only good things could come from a good God, so evil didn't come from him. Let's get that absolutely clear. But then evil did not originate with man either. We're not that original. We got it from somewhere else. Where then did evil come from? The Bible seems to state that evil began not with God, not with men, but among the angels. And that because of their supernatural power, they have been able to corrupt this world in which we live, not only at the human level, but at the level of nature too. Now, there isn't much written in the Bible about how evil began among the angels, because this book was not written for speculation. It was written for the main purpose of facing human beings with their responsibilities. And therefore, it is not important for you to know all that goes on among the bad angels. You only need to know about them insofar as they can influence your life for evil. But you don't need to know a whole lot of other things. But piecing together the hints there are in the Bible, we can say two things about the angels. For example, if we turn to the little letter of Jude, we're told that the angels did not keep their proper place, but left their proper dwelling. What does that mean? And then Peter, in his second letter, says, the angels, when they sinned. There are two things about the angels that come from those two texts. One, the angels had free will. They were messengers, not machines. They could say, God, I will not do what you want me to do. I'll not take this message for you. I will not fulfill this mission. They had free will. And the second thing that becomes clear is that they fell from their position of obedience. So the free will and the fall of angels is taught clearly in Scripture. And that's where they came from. They are not, of course, called angels when they fall. They are called demons. Now, it is a tragedy that that very word misleads us. Because it's a word that conjures up this kind of picture. Horrid little creatures, boiling people up in cauldrons, stirring them with pitchforks and all kinds of other lurid details. It was quite a bloodthirsty painting done in the Middle Ages. Unfortunately, we've inherited that kind of picture of a demon. But the word demon literally means inferior deity. Inferior deity. Someone nearly as powerful as God, but not quite. Someone below God and yet above us. And we must take demons terribly seriously. Now, how many are there? Well, I don't know how many angels there are altogether. If I knew that, I could tell you. Because according to the Bible, there is an indication in Revelation 12 that one third, one out of every three angels became a demon. Set himself against God and is working against the kingdom of God, which must frankly mean millions. And it is possible for such demons to get hold of a human being and possess them. 
Saul is a good example in the Old Testament and Mary Magdalene is an example of a woman in the New Testament. Human beings that have been taken over. It's quite extraordinary that science fiction is now producing the same kind of idea. Things that can come from outer space and inhabit the bodies of human beings. Long before science fiction thought of that, the Bible was talking about possessed people. It's more possible to meet it if you go overseas, if you go to Southeast Asia, you'll be up against this the whole time. If you go to any country where spirit worship is common, you'll see it. And of course, spirit worship is becoming increasingly common here. Now, in our Lord's ministry, he met six different people who were possessed by demons. There was an unclean spirit possessing one man, a blind and dumb spirit possessing another. There was a legion of spirits possessing the, the Gadarene demoniac. There was a dumb spirit, there was a girl, and there was a little boy. Now, not only did Christ meet these cases, but he also commissioned his disciples to fight them. That Jesus is the name high over all in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall and devils fear and fly. What are they trying to do? The answer is two things, to deceive people and to destroy them. This is the aim of every demon, to deceive you until your thinking is crooked, until you can't see straight, until you can't see the truth, to delude you, to twist you, and then to destroy you. Either to destroy you physically, throw you off a cliff or into the fire, to destroy you mentally, to destroy you morally, to destroy you socially until like the Gadarene demoniac, nobody dares come near you, or to destroy you spiritually. They are out to deceive and to destroy everyone they can get hold of. Now just as the Bible in talking of good angels talks about God, their leader, much more than good angels, so the Bible talks much more about the leader of the bad angels than the demons themselves. And it tells us a whole lot about uh, a person called Satan the devil. He is given five names and 24 titles in the New Testament. Our Lord Jesus is given 250 names and titles, but the devil gets five and 24 titles, more than any other person in the New Testament, apart from the Lord Jesus. Therefore it behoves us to look at what is said. He was the first to say to God, no, I will not be part of your kingdom, I want a kingdom of, of my own. And he went to the other angels and said, Will you come with me? Don't have this God over you. You come with me. And the demons are those who said yes. Now this most important and powerful angel of hell, whom Ezekiel tells us was the anointed cherub nearest to the throne of God, is the one we call Satan. I want to underline that. You can be as near to God as that. And you can rebel the nearest to the throne of heaven, and he said no to God. Now here are his names, here are the five names. Satan, Abaddon, which is in Greek Apollyon and means destroyer, Beelzebub, Belial, and Lucifer. Every one of them a horrid name. There's nothing sweet about those names, either in their meaning or their sound. Satan, Abaddon, I'm almost tempted to make a pun on that one. Beelzebub, Belial, Lucifer. He is described in language like this. Here are some of the adjectives. Subtle, wicked, unclean, evil, lying, and above all, proud. That's a horrible description of a character. Subtle, wicked, unclean, lying, angry, proud. And it's the last one that comes out most. He is described in terms of animals. Three animals are likened to him, or he is likened to them, and two of them come from the reptile family, which is interesting. A wily serpent, a snake in the grass, subtle, clever, wiling his way through to your heart. A red dragon, cruel, powerful, 
And then he is described as a prowling lion, a roaring lion, king of the jungle. When you go out of this church, you will be followed by a prowling lion. And if that were true physically, if there literally was, to your knowledge, a lion loose in Guildford, and you knew that it was prowling around North Street and Commercial Road, you would be on your guard. And the Bible uses this picture of the devil to tell you, watch it. Now look at some of the activities of the devil. I just wrote down these things from the scripture. He is a slanderer, he is a tempter, he is a deceiver, he is an accuser, he is a tormentor, he is a murderer, he is a destroyer. Why, if a human being could have all that said about him, he'd be in court straight away. And yet this, this person is on the loose. A slanderer. Whenever we slander people, the devil is using our mouths. He loves to slander. He loves to say things like that. He is a tempter, playing on the desires of our flesh. One of the texts in the Bible about this says that he plays us like fish. Have you ever seen a fisherman choosing his bait? Knowing just what to use and then playing the fish? I know how I'll get him. He's down there. I'll just play this above him. And the devil is doing just that when he lures and entices us. That's the phrase in James 1. He lures us, entices us out, and we just follow along. The farmer trying to get his pig to market and discovering that with a pig, if you drive it this way, it goes that way. I know that. I've discovered that. And the farmer eventually found that if he laid a trail of beans, the pig just came right along to the slaughterhouse and just picked up one bean at a time, followed along. The devil's a master at doing that. Drop something in front of you that you'd like, and another thing, and another thing, and along the track you go. Accuser, he is the self-appointed prosecution, counsel for the prosecution. Tormentor, he can cause you physical pain. Paul had a messenger of Satan in his flesh to torment him physical handicap that he had to battle with all his life and ministry. But I think it's the titles of the devil that worry me most. He is the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, and as Jesus called him, the God of this world. The only person Jesus ever called God apart from his own father. He said he is the God of this world. He's the one that people really worship, though they don't know it. He's the one that they really bow down before and they're just not aware of it. He is the prince of this world and the ruler. Why is the world in such a mess? What's the explanation? We've got good people, sincere, gifted people trying to put it right. We've got men of goodwill who want a good world for their children. Why can't they achieve it? Why will we never get there? Why can't we get any nearer? I'll tell you why, because the real person who's running this world is the devil. He's the prince of this world. And he'll make quite sure we don't get peace, except on his terms, which will be totalitarian surrender. And that's why we need to take him very seriously indeed. On one occasion, he's described as the prince of the power of the air. And the air in the Bible is always taken to mean that part of heaven that's nearest to us and that surrounds us and, as it were, hems us in. In other words, between us and highest heaven is the arena of Satan, ringing the earth, the air all around us. That is where he is, the prince of the powers of the air, between us and the highest heaven. Now he is a king and he has a kingdom and there are four words used in the Bible to describe that kingdom. It is a kingdom of disobedience. Everybody who's disobedient belongs to that kingdom. You were born into it, you grew up disobedient, you learned what it was to say no before you said yes. You never had to be taught to be bad, only to be good. You never had to be taught to be rude, only to be courteous. You never had to be taught to be dishonest, only to be honest. You were born in a kingdom of disobedience. And as Jesus said to those who would not believe in him, you are of your father the devil. Secondly, it's a kingdom of darkness, moral darkness, as well as physical. 
the darkness that there is in this world of ours and the deeds that are done in the dark because men dare not come to the light are the deeds of the kingdom of Satan. Satan loves darkness, which is why those who are in his grip love to live in darkness rather than light. They will love to sleep during the day and live at night, whereas God's plan was that men should work in the day and sleep at night while the beast slept in the day and came out at night. That's the plan of God in the Bible. But you'll find when the devil gets hold of someone, young people, when the devil gets hold of you, you keep later and later and later hours. You begin to live in the darkness, not the light. And it's amazing how the devil turns you around this way. It's a kingdom, thirdly, of disease. Why are there hospitals? Why are there doctors? Why are there nurses? Doctors and nurses who have to work in the dark and in the light and 24 hours a day. Why do we need all these health services? Why do we need medicines and pills and all the rest? Why do we need operations? I'll tell you why. Because we're living in the devil's kingdom. God never intended sickness and disease. It's not his will. And when they brought a woman to Jesus to be healed, he looked at her, he said, you see this woman? She's been bound by Satan these 18 years. 18 years Satan's had her body. With St. Paul, he had a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh. He asked God, take it away, take it away, take it away. And God said, no, in your case, I'm not going to because I think you can glorify my name even more by showing what grace can do with a messenger of Satan. And he left Paul with the disease. Sometimes God cures a disease, sometimes he leaves it. But every disease is a messenger of Satan. And what about death? Every time you see a hearse go along the road, you're seeing something that Satan did. Death was never intended for human beings. We were never intended to have our relationships broken. Death is something that Satan has introduced to our world. He never intended the profession of undertakers, did God? And they'll be out of a job later. I remember reading this sentence in a book and it hit me so forcibly. Every cemetery owes its existence to Satan. Well now this is his kingdom. What's he aiming at? What's he trying to do? The answer is he's trying to be God. He's trying to have a kingdom of his own. He's trying to be like God. And everybody he whispers to, he says, wouldn't you like to be like God? From the Garden of Eden onwards, it, wouldn't you like to be like God? Control yourself. Have your own kingdom, the power and the glory for yourself. That's what he does. He got hold of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, strutting around the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, said this, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. Listen to it. Is not this my kingdom, my power, my glory? Babylon. A few months later he was living like a beast, eating grass in the field and his fingernails were like claws and his hair was down here and he'd lost his sanity. It's said in the book of Isaiah about the devil himself, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far north, I will ascend the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the most high. And anybody who talks like that, whether he's trying to build an empire in big business, or whether he's being the big boss in his own family, Every man who's saying, mine is the kingdom, is a man whom Satan has got. One day Satan said to Jesus, Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world I'll give to you. He was offering him the post of Antichrist. One day a man will take that post from Satan and become the ruler of the world. Satan can give you the world. He can give you the power. He can give you the glory and the kingdom. All the kingdoms of the world belong to Satan and Jesus didn't contradict that. He didn't say they're not yours to give. He said, Satan, I'm going to go on serving God, not you. So he became the enemy, the adversary of God's kingdom. 
Here are some of the things he does according to my New Testament. He sows tares among the wheat. Wherever God's seed of the word is sown, Satan comes and he sows something else. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. Why is it that some of your unconverted friends and relatives won't listen to you? You talk to them. They need Christ and you tell them this and they're as blind and as dumb and as deaf as, as a corpse. What's happened? The answer is Satan has blinded them. Their minds are blind. They can't see. He masquerades as an angel of light. He got hold of Judas and he nearly got hold of Peter. Out of 12 disciples, Satan got hold of Judas through his money. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has wanted to have you, Peter. Of course he did. Peter was to be the first pastor of the church and Satan wanted him badly. And Jesus said, I prayed for you that Satan should not have you. He's not got you yet, Peter. Even though you've denied me, he's not got you. I'm going to hang on. And Jesus prayed against Satan. He hindered Paul in going to Thessalonica. He instigated the persecution and the martyrdom of Christians. No wonder the Lord's Prayer includes the phrase, deliver us from the evil one. Supposing you say to me, as you well could, I've never come across any evil spirits. I've never had any personal experience of the things you're talking about. I don't know whether to be glad or sorry for you. I really don't. You're going to find them one way or another and there is a wrong way to find them and a right way. Let me describe first of all the wrong way according to the Bible. Here are some of the wrong ways. The most obvious way to get through is spiritism. If spirits could give you peace, they would lose you again. They want to keep you dangling on the end of uncertain messages that make you want more and you're so easily hooked. You can so easily be led on by those beans down the line. Well now, spiritism, is there anything in it? Yes, there is. I remember going to see a widow whose sister had taken her along to a seance. And she said to me, is there anything in it? And I said, there certainly is. And she said, what a relief. She said, I've asked one or two others and they've just left and said it's all fraud and chicanery. But she said, there's something in it. And I said, yes, there is. So then she said, it's all right for me to go then. I said, no, it's all wrong. If there was nothing in it, it would be all right to go. There is fraud, there is chicanery, there is telepathy, but there is reality too, real reality. There are people in this congregation who could tell you that. You can get through and you can get messages that tell you things that nobody else knows in the world about you and about your loved ones because the spirits know. It is absolutely forbidden to God's people to dabble. Absolutely forbidden. Leviticus 19, Isaiah 8 and Micah 5 are enough to tell you that. Indeed in the Old Testament a Jew caught dabbling in that was sentenced to death. So seriously was it regarded. One of the favorite tricks of the devils is to plant within the Church of Christ those who preach heresy. And he always plants the nicest possible people, kindly, friendly, who have taken the glorious gospel of Christ and just twisted it here and there. We're told in the New Testament again and again to beware of tickling ears that just want to hear some new teaching, some new theology, some new doctrine, because the devils just love it. Well then let me come to the right way to get through. We are supposed to get through to them, but in the right way, and I'll tell you how. As soon as your Christianity becomes supernatural, as soon as you break through into the heavenly places, you'll meet them. As soon as your religion gets above the chapel roof and gets into the heavenly places, you'll be aware of a tremendous battle. Your prayer life will become a battle. You'll become aware of evil forces fighting what you do. In other words, it's because we are so ordinary and so mundane and so down to earth in a sense in our faith that we never get into the heavenly places where the battle is on. You can go to church without ever meeting an evil spirit. You can sing hymns. But if you're going to get into the front line, you'll meet them. 
If you're going to get on your knees, that's where you'll meet them. Get into the prayer meeting, that's where you meet the power of evil. Get into the front line of the battle, it's up there. And therefore it may be that our experience of these things is limited because we are not as near to God as we need to be. Or to put it simply, when the Holy Spirit is really operating in your life, the evil spirits will be operating against you. But when the Holy Spirits are not, the Holy Spirit is not operating, the evil spirits leave you alone. They've no need to bother. Why should they bother? But when we are living in the heavenly places, in the forefront of the battle, then we must expect to feel the presence of evil. When we do, there's only one simple thing to do, and it works. It is to say, in the name of Jesus, go. They have no choice, no choice at all, confronted with the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. No demon, no devil can say a thing or do a thing.